Hello again YouTube. So here's that video I promised you about a little Rubik's Cube simulator I worked on a while back. But what this video is really all about is how this puzzle, your bog standard 3x3 Rubik's Cube, is actually 100% equivalent or isomorphic to this strange contraption here. Now I hope you'll stick around for that part of the video because I'm going to crap on for a bit about how I got back into cubing recently after a very long break. At least part of the reason I started this YouTube channel was to share stories with my family and friends that perhaps they haven't heard before, so I hope you'll indulge me. So, let's rewind all the way back to the 80s. I was given a Rubik's Cube by my father at about the age of five or six, and along with the cube, a book on how to solve it. To sweeten the deal, I was told that I would get the princely sum of $5 if I could solve it with the aid of the book. Now it turns out that this took me quite a long time, on the order of a few months. I distinctly remember being a killjoy at a family holiday we went on at the time. I couldn't be prized away from the cube, even though I was struggling just to get the second layer done. Anyway, eventually I persevered and managed to get quite good at the first two layers, and I remember getting through the last layer happened a lot faster than the first two. This is funny because it's actually the most complicated part of the solution. You have to rearrange the little cubies on the last face without disturbing what you've already done. Now, I do remember that my dad coughed up the five dollars, but not after, well not before, re-scrambling the cube and forcing me to do it again. Fortunately, I had learned the method and although it probably took me another half an hour or so, I did manage it. After that, with a little bit more practice, I was able to memorize all the moves, and it was around that time that I became a minor celeb celebrity at my school. Something I really enjoyed, and probably one of the reasons why, to this day, being an intellectual is so much a part of my personal identity. All the other kids would bring their scrambled cubes to school and get me to unscramble them. Once I'd finished, they'd usually scramble them again and get me to solve them again. Now. This reminds me of something I think I should let you know. It really doesn't matter how much you scramble a cube. It won't appreciably change how long it takes a cube to solve it. Maybe a few seconds or minutes, depending on how fast they already are. But you're never going to stump a person who knows how to solve a cube. Just some quick facts. Now, the number of possible states that the Rubik's Cube can be in is truly colossal. It's 43 quintillion or thereabouts. But really, how big is that number? Well, it's not 43 million, which we'll all agree is rather large. It's not 43 billion, which is a thousand times larger. It's not even 43 trillion, which is a thousand times larger than that. Nope, not even 43 quadrillion, which is, you guessed it, a thousand times larger than that. Yes, it's 43 quintillion. A number which is 43 times a million, times a million, times another million. Incidentally, have you spotted the pattern in the way we name large numbers? Million, or mono, as I like to think of it. Billion, or bi, or two. Trillion, three. Quadrillion, four. Quintillion, five. That means there are five sets of three zeros after the initial three that you get with a thousand. Look, I've put it on the screen there for you. Count them. Six sets of three zeros. Anyway, I digress. It's a lot of combinations. But get this, some clever people have proved that a cube is never more than 20 moves away from being solved. And this is just the maximum number of moves. Only 300 million of the 43 quintillion combinations will require 20 moves. The majority of configurations will be less than that even. So dear viewers, if you've already done 50 or so twists of the cube while scrambling it, don't bother doing any more. Now you might be thinking, do speed cubers get anywhere close to this 20 moves or so? Well no, I don't think so. An efficient solution is deemed to be in the 40 to 50 moves range, and an average using the Friedrich method is in the 50 to 70 range. Which leads me to the next part of what I want to tell you. As a youngster, 
I learned a really quite poor solution to the Rubik's Cube. It used to take me anywhere from 2.5 minutes up to 5 minutes to solve it. Part of this is because cubes were pretty crappy back in the 80s. They didn't turn particularly smoothly, but mostly it was down to the fact that the method I learned was just very inefficient. Anyway, cue the passage of time. About three years ago I decided I was going to learn how to do the cube again because frankly I'd forgotten how to do anything more than the top layer. And what I discovered is that the construction of cubes has come a long way since the 80s. You could now buy very decent speed cubes off the shelf. So I bought one. Here's one here. And as you can see, it's just really, really nice to use. Look, I've learned, you know, the basic finger tricks here. And it looks like I'm, you know, doing it very, very, very fast. And I can do it very fast because uh, I've learned how to do it since then. So imagine my delight when I discovered that there was a wealth of information online about how to solve the cube. I decided to start with the simple goal of learning what's called the beginner's method. This one has the advantage that there's just not that much to remember. Now I'm getting old and I just don't learn things as fast as I used to, but I was able to learn the algorithms within about a day and then start doing the cube in a very respectable two and a half minutes. But geez, it was inefficient. You could just tell there was a lot of repetition involved. So the next thing I decided to do was learn what's known as the CFOP method. I might go into what that stands for in a future video, but for now I'll just say that it's a popular method that a lot of speed cubers use. However, there are a lot more moves to learn. In fact, there are so many moves to learn on the last layer that I am still using the easier to remember two look method rather than the one look method. This means I only have to remember about 20 algorithms instead of over 100, but I do have to look down at the cube twice on each step of the last layer. Nevertheless, after a few months of practicing it on the train as I went to and from work, I was able to get my speed down to about 40 seconds on average. Pretty bloody respectable for an old fart like me. Oh, that reminds me of a story that I just have to tell you. So, when I had reached the point of being able to solve the cube in less than 60 seconds, I decided that I would go down to Melbourne for a weekend to observe the Australian National Competition. In retrospect, I'm really glad I de didn't enter in the competition and just went along as a spectator. I'd say the mean age of the competition was somewhere around 13 years of age. Now, I've heard that mathematics is a young man's game, but this really takes the cake. There were some older people there, but they were almost invariably the parents of the children that were competing. In fact, it was assumed that I was the parent of one of the children. A number of people around my age came up to me and asked, So, um, which one is your son? There was this one particularly precocious child that I ended up talking to at one point who was telling me all about the different cube-like puzzles that he'd mastered in just the last year. The 2x2, two two, the 3x3, three three, the 4x4, four four, the skewb, the mirror blocks, you name it. I sheepishly told him that I'd just learned the 3x3 three three and that I'd only managed to get down to around 55 seconds or so in my solves. Now what he said next to me was just the most precious thing. He said, well don't feel bad. Your ability to learn new things drops off precipitously after puberty. <laughs> he meant well but he had no idea that an older person might find that incredibly offensive. Fortunately, I didn't, and just secretly hoped that one day I'd have a son that precocious. Anyway, I had a great time down there, despite feeling terribly out of place, and that is when I came across this puzzle, the mirror blocks. It's a really odd little puzzle. Look at it, it's just all over the place. You can rotate it, in all the ways that you can a regular 3x3 three three cube, but the cuts in it are of non-equal lengths, so it forms into some really odd shapes. Something else you might notice about it is that it's all the same colour, a nice shiny silver. But here's the most interesting thing about it. If you know how to do the regular 3x3 three three Rubik's Cube, then you actually know how to do this puzzle. But the interesting thing is, it's really hard. I can do this rather fast, 
This takes me about half an hour. Now, how is this puzzle anything like the regular 3x3? Well, first of all, it has three different cuts in all of the three dimensions, just like the 3x3 cube. It has all of the same rotations, but it really looks very different, doesn't it? Now, you see, there is a secret trick, a special way of thinking about the mirror blocks puzzle that makes it equivalent to the 3x3. In fact, I'm going to use a mathematical term and say that the mirror blocks puzzle is isomorphic to the 3x3. So, you ready for the secret trick? Here it is. The colour of a cubie, that's actually the term for it, on the 3x3 cube is equivalent to the height of a cubie on the mirror blocks. But don't take my word for it. I'm going to demonstrate it to you using a combined Rubik's and mirror blocks simulator that I programmed tenaciously over a weekend about, ooh, 1.5 years ago. Now before I show it to you, I'd li just like to give a shout out to the creator of the original Rubik's Cube simulator that I based the code on. His name, according to GitHub, is Michel van der Blanc. Apologies if I've mispronounced his name. Now something that not many people know is that modern web browsers are capable of some really nice 3D graphics right out of the box using something known as WebGL, which is a cut-down version of the well-known OpenGL graphics standard. Now I'm not much of a designer. I'm really not very good at making things look pretty, but it turns out that Michel is quite talented in that department and made this really pretty simulator where you could rotate the cube and move each of the faces just like a regular cube. Let's have a look at that right now. Okay, so here's Michel van der Blanc. That's what he looks like. This is his GitHub page. And here is his simulator. So we've got a nice 3 by 3 cube here. And you'll notice that if I click my left button down here and pull, I can start rotating the faces just like I would a regular cube. And it's just a really nice piece of work. Like it, it looks really pretty. It looks like a 3 by 3 cube. It moves really nicely. And it was, you know, a good foundation for what I ended up programming, which is this. So I simply forked his code off GitHub. GitHub's a place where people can share their code openly. And I modified it over the course of a weekend to create this. And what this is, is a combined side-by-side -side simulation of the regular cube and the mirror blocks. This is what the mirror blocks looks like when you've solved it. It looks like a cube, but it very, very quickly gets out of whack. So what you're going to see right now is as I change this cube here, this one will also have the same move done on it. So if I rotate the front face like this, that does not appear to be working. Let me just refresh that. I move the front face, I move the top face, I move the middle face, I move the bottom face, I rotate my cube around a bit just to get a bit of a look at it. I flip, I flip, 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 rotate, there we go. Now this is quite messed up now. Now what I want you to do is look very carefully at that isomorphism that I told you about before. Now notice here that these three cubes here are white. And also, notice here that these three cubes are exactly the same height. If I rotate it, you can see that a little bit more clearly. Same goes with these orange ones here, all the same height. Now, we've got green, and we've got two yellows here, different heights. The two blues, same height. Orange, different height. So, if you stare at the mirror cubes in just the right way, you can see it as the regular colourful 3 by 3 cube and um, that allows you to solve it using exactly the same moves. So um, you can see the, uh, the URL up the top here and I'll display that down the bottom of the screen and you can have a play by yourself. I, th I think this project turned out really really nicely and I think it demonstrates the concept of an isomorphism really really well. So um, thank you very much for uh, 
listening to this short video and I'll hopefully put something up again, again soon. And um, so yeah, I guess what I'm saying is if you click on subscribe, you will not be disappointed because I will have some new content for you soon.